a very warm welcome to all the participants who have joined in and uh, a warm welcome to our uh, speaker for today, Professor Brian Hedlund. Uh, we have a pleasure of uh, conducting this uh, very successful series, uh, Business Live. We are into the sixth session today, and uh, it's been uh, a pleasure to host this. Uh, so once again, a warm welcome to all of you. I invite uh, Professor Brian Hedlund for his, uh, for his talk on taxonomy of uncultivated microorganisms, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Before we get into it, I would like to share some uh, information and uh, Professor Brian's uh, achievements. Um, Brian is fascinated by the microbial dark matter and its ecological rele relevance. From his PhD work on Veruco microbia at the University of Washington in 2000 to his postdoctoral work on the cultivation of thermophiles from the Yellowstone National Park, Brian has established an expertise in the microbial ecology, genomics, biogeochemical cycling, physiology, and taxonomy of this vast diversity, and quite especially the thermophiles. So a major part of his group works on thermophiles. Uh, his group at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, is leading the efforts on microbial taxonomy for the next decade, using an inclusive approach to cover the uncultivated microorganisms. Uh, Brian has received several awards throughout his research career most recent being the Nevada Regents Mid-Career Researcher Award in 2019. Brian has received several successful grant awards from NASA, NSF, NIH, DOE, JGI, Amazon, and several other uh, funding agencies. He's published uh, close to 100 high-impact research articles, including many in science and nature. He's been very actively publishing just quite a few minutes ago, I was uh, we were sharing some news, and he's recently completed seven uh, funding awards uh, successfully. So that's a very big achievement to complete seven awards in a single year. Uh, Brian was an editor for the Burgess Manual as well as the Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. He is currently serving on the editorial board of Applied and Environmental Microbiology, Geobiology, Frontiers in Microbiology, and Extremophiles. Overall, uh, Brian has been, uh, you know, sort of a torch bearer, I should call it, in terms of uh, uh, doing single cell genomics and, uh, and working on thermophiles and looking at the dark matter. Um, so with this, uh, I welcome Brian to uh, start his talk and uh, enlighten our participants on the taxonomy of uncultivated microorganisms, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Brian, I welcome you uh, to this forum. Thank you, Kamlesh. That was a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, thank you, Kamlesh and, and Wenjun and, and Amit uh, for hosting me here. It's an incredible honor. I mean, the, the, the lineup that you've uh, invited for this series has been amazing and, and I, feel, uh, I feel humbled uh, to be included in this. Um, so as Kemlesh introduced, I'm at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And if people aren't familiar with Las Vegas, here's just a shot of Las Vegas. It's a, it's a big uh, gambling and, and tourist center. But if you go outside of Las Vegas, you uh, very quickly get into uh, desert areas. And uh, the state of Nevada has uh, by far the lowest population density outside of the two cities. And um, there's a lot of cowboys and there's uh, uh, cattle ranches and things like that. And so um, that's why I chose this title. Um, so the, the taxonomy of uncultivated microorganisms has been compared by several researchers, not me, but other people to the wild west of taxonomy. And so I thought, you know, why not? I live, uh, I live in the wild west and, and people call tax, the taxonomy of uncultivated microbes a wild west, so let's go for it. So, um, by the way, even my university over here, the logo is a cowboy or a frontiersman. So, you know, it all fits, right? So the image over on the left is a, a famous actor named Clint Eastwood. And this is one of his famous movies, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And so I'm gonna use this. Um, <laughs> this basically comes from three different cowboys in the movie, 
they're all seeking a, a treasure around the time of the American Civil War. So Clint Eastwood is the good, and then there's a, another guy who's the bad, and another guy who's who's the ugly. Anyway, this movie has a, a you know a good cowboy and a bad cowboy and an ugly cowboy, and so I'm going to use those themes to uh, throughout my talk just for a little fun, right? Okay. And uh, before I get into it, I'm going to thank some people, with, but this also serves as an outline of my presentation. So the first part of my talk, I'll pop, talk about types of types. So I'll have a comparative approach of different uh, categories of nomen nomenclatural types. And this is a draft of a manuscript. So any feedback that I can get will be useful for this manuscript. So second, I'll talk a, a little bit about the seek code initiative which has been mentioned in a few of the presentations, but I'll, I'll introduce it in any case. And then third, I, I'm gonna actually talk you through some data um, with a, a new uncultivated group of microbes of, that's been of interest. It's not really new, we've been working on it for quite a while, but we're getting close to launching it. And uh, it's a, a, a family level group that we'll, we call uh, Wolframii Raptor ACA. Um, so, uh, there's a number of team members um, on this paper. So Stefan uh, uh, Buziker and Marika Palmer are the two uh, first authors, so co-first authors. Jeremy Dodsworth is actually the corresponding author and launched a lot of this work. And uh, really it was a global effort. So here's Wenjun Lee, um, he's been part of this and people might recognize some of the other names. So I just wanna thank, uh, you know, all the people on this slide and in fact, other people uh, for, for help for all, all the work I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so before I launch into the good, the bad and the ugly, I wanted to just bring up one definition and because it's so important in nomenclature and that definition is the nomenclatural type. So I'm taking the ICN, uh, this is the botanical code definition, but a no nomenclatural type or type is an element to which the name of a taxon is permanently attached. Um, in the back, I have a number of nomenclatural types from Charles Darwin. So these are Darwin's finches, and you can even see in the labels down here, it says type and type and, and type, okay? So these are actually the physical specimens, the nomenclatural types for these various species of Darwin's finches. They're at the Natural History Museum in London. And if you wanna study uh, related finches and compare them to these finches, you know, this would be the type uh, specimen, the, the type, the nomenclatural type for all comparisons uh, uh, to, that, um, uh, to that species. And you know, for the, the, these uh, uh, Darwin's finches, you can even see that that the beaks have evolved and, and, and especially these comparisons would be made of, of, of the beaks. And so, um, you know, the broader concept of, of nomenclatural types actually did come from the botanical code um, and, and all, the, uh, all the other codes or several of the other codes have, have used the, the same concept. So it's very, very important. So it's something that, that the name is attached to, okay? All right, so I'm gonna bring in the good here already. <laughs> so the good. So um, I'm gonna talk about the ICNP uh, first. So the International Code of Nomenclature Prokaryotes. This is the, the, the document that is really the, the legislative document for naming uh, taxa uh, of prokaryotes um, under the, uh, uh, under, this is really the only code that's, that's focused on prokaryotes. And so two of the rules I think are particularly uh, uh, good here, in my opinion. So one of them is rule 18a, and it says whenever possible, the type of a species or subspecies is a designated strain. Okay, so a strain, um, you know, is, is a, a specific uh, thing. So, um, uh, Furthermore, Rule 30, um, as of January 2001, um, the description should include uh, a viable culture that the strain uh, and the strain uh, uh, of that viable culture must be deposited into two publicly accessible culture collections in different countries. Okay, so not only do you have to have a, a, a normally a pure culture, okay, 
but that peer culture has to be shared in two different countries. And so um, that allows the, the community of researchers to get those strains and to study them. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some strengths of the, the C code, or I'm sorry, the strengths of, the, of, uh, of these rules and, and strengths of working with peer cultures in general. And so it starts really at the beginning of peer culture work. So the first peer cultures were isolated in the, in the lab of Robert Koch in Germany in the 1870s and 1880s. And um, he used solid growth media, originally potato slices, if I remember right. And he picked off uh, the uh, colonies that grew on these boiled potato slices. And he correctly interpreted that those were pure cultures that descended from a single cell that landed and grew. And he used those initial pure cultures, not just for curiosity, but to test the germ theory of disease. So the germ theory of disease is the very theory that microbes uh, can cause diseases. And um, he successfully tested the germ theory of disease along with uh, his partner, uh, Frederick uh, Loeffler. And together they developed uh, Koch, Koch's postulates, originally Loeffler's po postulates because he published them before Koch did. So here are uh, three of the, the uh, eventual four Koch's postulates, but basically the organism has to be shown to, to be present in all cases of the disease and present in disease tissue. Then the organism has to be isolated as a pure culture. And then the pure culture has to be shown to reproduce the disease in a, in a naive uh, host. Okay, so this is beautiful, right? So you, you go to the environment, you isolate a pure culture, and then you take that pure culture back to an environment and do an experiment to test a hypothesis. This is beautiful stuff. And so th this, you know, we don't have to go any further. This is the birth of pure cultures. And this is also the biggest strength of pure cultures. And this isn't just for, you know, studying uh, pathogenic microbes because these, these, uh, these same principles can just be modified, you know, to study uh, microbes and in other environments to study their role in nature. All right, so some advantages of studying pure cultures is that pure cultures are simplified systems, and, and this allows unambiguous assignment of properties to those simplified systems. This mirrors progress that, that occurs and, and principles in chemistry and geology, right? You want to purify an element or a chemical compound or a mineral, and, and that allows us to really understand uh, that, that, uh, that, that thing that's being studied. It's also the best case scenario for reproducibility and experimental control and hypothesis testing. It's also a great resource to get a lot of data, okay? We can study microbes out in nature, but it's pretty hard to get data, you know, that we can assign to those organisms. If you have a pure culture, you can work pretty fast, all right? And, and lastly, it supports hypothesis testing with natural systems. So you remember Koch's postulates, um, you know, Koch didn't stop with a pure culture, but he went back, he went out to nature and uh, he tested the activity of those organisms in nature. And in that case, it was uh, animal models of, of disease. Um, so I think this, by the way, is something that's lost a little bit on the current uh, microbial systematics community, because I think the systematics community or most members of the systematics community do not go back to the natural system and really carefully consider what the organism is doing out in nature. And that, by the way, isn't always the exact same thing as what it's doing in the laboratory. Sometimes, uh, you know, properties are expressed only in natural systems or properties that we think are important in the lab may or may not be important in different natural systems. Okay, some more advantages of culture, of, culture, uh, of those rules in the ICNP. As I mentioned, they mandate the deposition of strains into two culture collections. And so this greatly improves the stability of the cultures. Um, these culture collections work really hard to, to, to make these stable. Um, this also pr promotes international sharing and cooperation for both science and business purposes. Um, this also promotes use of strains as common standards and controls for experiments. And it also is, is just uh, critical for reproducibility in science. 
right? And so if somebody describes a, a property of an organism and I, I want to study that or, or try, you know, if I doubt it, I can get that strain from a culture collection and uh, I can test it. And so this is really, you know, strong parts of science. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to the bad. And this might be a little confusing because this is the same exact slide I showed before. Okay, so the bad of the ICNP, in my opinion, is the same combination of Rule 18A and Rule 30B. Okay, so again, this is mandating that the type is a strain and the, the type should be a, a pure culture and it should be viable and it has should be uh, must be deposited into two uh, 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 culture collections in two different countries. So how, how could that be? You know, that's a, a conundrum, right, or a paradox. How could the same two rules be excellent and, and bad at the same time? But I contend that they are, okay? So why, why is it bad? And this, this brings up the uncultured majority problem. And this has been brought up in some of the other lectures in, in the series, but I'm just gonna go through it with my own flavor because I don't, I don't think of it exactly the same way that other people do. So um, other people have mentioned species, right? So there are about 20,000 species of validly named archaea and bacteria. And um, th that's pretty good. We know, we know uh, Aaron Oren correctly said that a strength of, of the system under the, the ICNP and the ICSP is that we have a precise number. And that's wonderful because that's not always true of the other codes. Um, but we don't have the denominator very well. So we don't really know how many microbial species are out there very well, in my opinion. And so anyway, a very conservative number is less than 1%. But what I think is actually more important to me personally, and I would argue that it should be more important to you as well, is the higher, higher ranks, okay? So these are numbers according to the Genome Taxonomy Database. Uh, remember, Phil Hugenholt spoke about that in the first lecture. And I love the, the genome taxonomy database. I'll use that word, okay? And the GTDB says that the, as of right now, they, they list 149 phyla. That's not a perfect final number, but it's a pretty good number. Um, and I counted 46 of those with uh, at least one pure culture. So that's about a third, okay? So that means two thirds of the phyla. So this is the highest rank within bacteria have not a single pure culture. So none of those could be submitted to a culture collection because there's nothing to submit and none of those can be named, okay? And Archaea, the most recent uh, release of GTDB says 20 phyla with only four pure cultures. We're down to 20% here. And so to me, this is actually a bigger problem. It's not, in my opinion, it's, it's more accurate because we don't know the denominator out here, but um, uh, you know, um, if you believe in the framework of the genome taxonomy database, I think we're getting, um, this, this system is, is, it's not mature, it's not final, but I think these numbers are much more reliable and also much more compelling than these numbers up here. So it's a big problem. I mean, I think anybody could, could admit that this is a big problem. All right, so you know, people sometimes tell me, well, I study microbes in hot springs and near boiling places, and, and th those are weird organisms. And you know, maybe this microbial dark matter problem or this uncultured uh, majority problem is only in these weird places, right? But it actually, it's not true. Um, so this is a paper, a genomic catalog of Earth's microbiomes. Uh, it's a community paper, part of the Microbial Dark Matter 2 project, and led by Emily Elo Fadroch at the Joint Genome Institute. And the most, uh, to me, the most interesting um, summary in this, uh, I think this is figure four from the paper, is shown in blue. And so uh, in blue, what we're seeing is a cumulative bar graph for uh, PD, this is phylogenetic um, diversity. So it's a sum of the total branch length represented by uncultivated genomes. So these are, are uh, metagenome assembled genomes or single cell amplified genomes, okay? Or in the white, these are cultivated organisms, okay? 
or then in, in light blue, we have an overlap actually uh, where uh, we get both. And then here we have the phyla, or at least some of the phyla of bacteria and some of the phyla of archaea. And you can see that in any phylum, this dark blue bar is dominant, okay? So this is a, a you know, a, a taxon taxonomy independent uh, measure of, of the branch length of, you know, the, the actual phylogenetic diversity. And so you can pick out your favorite phylum, but even, even uh, you know, even proteobacteria, uh, th these dark branches are, are dominating. And then we could, we could ask the same question for biomes, right? And so here's a bunch of different biomes on earth, you know, you pick out your favorite one, and then you could look at, um, you know, how, the, the balance of cultivated versus uncultivated uh, organisms, uh, um, or the phylogenetic diversity represented by this collection of genomes. And so really any of these um, sediment that, this is pretty weird, but um, I don't think that's, that, that might be a sampling problem. But anyway, um, any habitat, any taxonomic group, you know, these, these uh, you know, dark lineages um, that represent the, uh, you know, the uncultivated majority, these are abundant and, and widespread, okay? Just to continue why this is bad, the code itself, the ICNP, the general consideration number five, which is a, a, a very important uh, a preamble basically to the code, it says this code of nomenclature of prokaryotes applies to all prokaryotes, but it doesn't apply to all prokaryotes because I just told you that the rules prevent naming of most of the organisms, okay? And so this is a, a sort of a cheap gag, um, but you know, we, we, we could, I'll point it out because you know, I think this makes the point. This code is restricted, it's highly restricted. It's the international code of nomenclature of cultivated prokaryotes because it doesn't extrapolate to most of the tree of life. Okay, it's 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 uh, too restrictive. Okay, so now I'm going to walk you through some of the major points for my draft manuscript for new microbes and new infections. And so any feedback I hear about this will be will be important because it's not submitted yet. But basically, what I'm going to try to convince you here is that the ICNP is uniquely rigid, okay? It, it, it's not like, um, oh, there are similar, similar problems in other codes. There are not similar problems in other codes. This is a unique problem to the ICNP due to those two rules. Um, and, and so the, I'm gonna try to convince you we can change this. All right, so I showed you Darwin's finches before, you know, for large animals and insects, this is the typical mode of, of you know, this is what a, a type is. Um, for plants, um, usually it, it's an herbarium type sheet, okay? So for each species, you would have pressed plants that would include important features, you know, such as uh, flowers or seeds, uh, leaves and stems, uh, roots. Um, you know, you wanna be able to see all the diagnostic features on these type sheets, okay? Um, here's a favorite, right? Who has kids? Uh, I actually don't have kids, but I still love uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, right? This is the type specimen of Tyrannosaurus rex. This is in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, actually what you don't know by looking at this is that this fossil is only about 20% complete. The rest of this is reconstructed, but it's still good enough to serve as a type. We can still, um, you know, it has enough characters in that 20%. To, to be able to compare uh, uh, to and identify T-Rex if we see it again, okay? Um, this is my cousin, Homo habilis, uh, old by uh, uh, hominid number seven. So this is the type, uh, part of the type, um, nomenclatural type for Homo habilis. Um, this particular uh, 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 skeleton, is about, uh, it includes about 20 bones or parts of about 20 bones and 14 teeth. Um, so it's, it's way less than 10% of a, of a human skeleton. Um, but, you know, Homo habilis was named after this and, and this is the type specimen. And, um, you know, that, that works. And who, I mean, I hope everybody's heard of Homo habilis, right? And so um, what I'm trying to drive you toward here is that these other codes are much more uh, uh, 
um, um, have a much more open idea about what a nomenclatural type is. Here's another one, okay. This is a paratype for the ciliate Euplodes rariceta, okay. So this is a, a slide um, and under, underneath the slide is a, not a pure culture, but a culture that contains the Euplodes uh, rariceta. And um, together with the description of what this organism looks like, you can look at this slide as preserved with silver as a preservative, and you can see that and you can identify at least the morpho species. Although there is, uh, I, I have to acknowledge that these other codes aren't perfect. For example, the people studying micro eukaryotes are, are, are fairly frustrated because they're covered, they're split under two different codes, the botanical code and the zoological code. And, um, a lot of them recognize and, and that that morphological species like this on the slide aren't good enough to distinguish closely related species. So there are movements mainly for RNA uh, RNA seq data, um, so uh, um, to to uh, be included as a, a, a type in that type of situation. Um, so by the way, you know we aren't the only people that are suggesting that that nucleotide sequence data could serve as a nomenclatural type. All right, so I just want to compare these three codes, and these are the, um, the, the first two are the dominant codes I'll show you in, a, in another slide, but um, I'll keep ours in there because that's our focus, right? So the ICN, this is the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants, okay? And so what are the acceptable types? A single specimen in an herbarium or other collection, or a published or unpublished illustration Okay, that's that's amazing to me. Um, or metabolically inactive but viable cultures of algae and fungi. These aren't pure cultures necessarily, but they're viable cultures. So this is the, the closest thing we have. But mind you, that's not not necessarily mandated here. Okay, so the ICZN is the zoological code, and there's a long description of types that that can serve. I already showed you several examples. Right, so we can have an animal or a part of an animal, okay, or part of a fossil or a complete fossil, okay. Um, we could have uh, for protists, we could have a, a type slide, okay. Um, so ba basically, uh, or, or we could even have, um, uh, so anyway, we just have to have something to identify that organism. And this is what the, the, the zoologists have decided can identify that organism. So several kinds of, of types here. By the way, these types um, for these two codes above span greater than 21 orders of magnitude in mass for the, for the organisms. They span from single cells to greater than 18, uh, 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 10 to the 18th cells. Um, and they, they span over a billion years of extinct organisms. And so, um, what I'm gonna to try to convince you here is that these two other codes, um, by allowing a variety of types, these other codes serve a broad, uh, serve broad communities of botanists and zoologists by empowering them to use resources that are appropriate for the organisms they study, okay? This is the key point of the paper that I'm preparing to submit. This is a unique problem of the ICNP. Okay, the ICNP is the only code that only practically allows one, uh, uh, one category of a type. It's the only code that requires types to be uh, viable. It's the only code that, that uh, requires types to be, uh, um, to be azenic. Okay, so this is right here. Uh, this is a unique problem of the ICNP. And you can see the outcome of that problem. There's a, here's, that's the cause and here's the effect. This is a pie chart based on the Catalog of Life 2019 annual checklist. This is highly imperfect um, because the, 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 the accounting for these things aren't, aren't really that good. But if we look at single celled organisms, um, this is a very small part of, of the pie chart. And if we zoom in on single celled organisms, we see that even within that group, bacteria and archaea make up uh, less than half. And this, by the way, doesn't include um, single-celled uh, fungi because I, I couldn't parse those out easily. And, and so um, less than 1% of total species 
cover archaea and bacteria. And I think we would all agree that this isn't the reality. This isn't the natural system, right? This is a human caused problem. And the problem is that the ICMP is uniquely rigid and it's been uniquely rigid only since 2001, okay? So since 2001, um, uh, we've started this problem where we can't make uh, progress and this is the outcome. And I think the outcome is, is, is serious because we have trouble communicating um, we have code names for uncultured microbes, and those code names are, are not well defined. They're not uh, they're not given priority. They're not attached to a type, so no people often don't really know what the name is, is attached to. It's the wild west. It is the wild west. Uh, with uh, and and I told you before, this is the majority. This is not this is not the minority. This is the majority. Is the wild west? That's for sure. So people ask, what about candidata status? So this is an appendix of the code. So it's not legislative. There's no direction to the community on how to designate a type because candidatus taxa are not eligible to have a type. There's no explicit direction on nomenclature and therefore most candidatus names are not eligible to graduate to a valid name under the ICNP if the, if the rules were changed. Um, this, the candidatus, um, are also difficult to satisfy because depending on what literature you read, um, e either visualizing the organisms in situ is, is either required or highly recommended. And so that's not that easy a thing to do, but it does make for good science, by the way. Um, it's a provisional term with no priority and it's rankless. Um, so I've argued and, and Costas and Ramon have actually argued in the past that candidata status should be modified a little bit. And there have been some other proposals as well um, to, to embrace this, but, but uh, currently it, it, it's, it doesn't really work. Okay, so based on these problems, uh, Barney Whitman made a proposal and his proposal has been introduced before in these meetings. The proposal is that, that DNA sequence data like genomes uh, or fragments of genomes could serve as, as nomenclatural types to name archaea and bacteria, okay? And the original proposal was to expand the ICMP to allow this to serve as a type so that it would be consistent with the other codes that allow multiple kinds of types. And, and really, again, this would allow, this would empower the broader community of microbiologists to use uh, information and, and data resources that are relevant for the organisms they study, okay? Um, so there are some arguments about that. Um, Costas and Ramon and, and Rudy Amman uh, published this perspective in ISME journal, and that really got a lot of attention to this problem. Um, Oren and Garrity replied, and then those authors replied back. But ultimately, Oren uh, showed this in his presentation. There was a vote and the, and the vote lost, okay? So the ICMP voted to, to retain this uniquely restrictive um, category of type. Um, so, um, you know, it is what it is, right? So that's, that's the story. So this is the good and the bad, right? We're stuck with this. We're stuck with rule 18A and rule 30B. Um, this is great, uh, makes for great science, but it's bad because we can't really progress to most of the tree of life. Okay, it's a big problem in my opinion. So um, there we are. And I, I, I took a little time to, uh, you know, people can have their own opinions, but I made a checklist, you know, and I, hey, do I believe, you know, that strains are, are better types or genomes are better types? And by the way, this has nothing to do with, with whether strains are useful to study or important to study. Uh, my lab, if you look at my publications, my lab cares a lot about isolating strains and studying and describing uh, pure cultures. Um, and so trust me, I'm not against strains, but the issue at hand here is, is the, the, the categories of nomenclatural types. And so if you look at a bunch of categories, we can ask ourselves, you know, which are better, okay? Unambiguous means to identify the species. I say that strains have the slight advantage because you can get a better genome from a strain, from a pure culture. 
You can also test physiological properties if you want to. It's easier than with microbes out in nature. Experimental value, hands down. I'd rather have a strain, right? I'd rather have a pure culture. I can test uh, any phenotypic property I want. Um, you know, that's, that's great, okay? Ability to scale to most or all taxa. This is the problem I've been talking about. Genomes can do that, okay? Strains cannot do that. We're not making much progress. We're making progress. I'm working hard, but it's not good enough, okay? Stability through time. The, the, these data uh, um, in, in, um, in the, the major data repositories are cloned uh, on many computers on, on several continents. They're very stable, okay? Um, bindability. I think that's high. We can all find strains. We can all find uh, databases with, with uh, DNA sequences. Accessibility is higher for genomes, okay? This is because uh, the strains cost some money. It takes some time. Um, it takes a lot of expertise in the laboratory to work with these strains and, and preserve the strains in your laboratory. The cost, uh, if you have internet access, it's certainly cheaper to get a genome. The time to access the type, certainly easier and faster if you have an internet connection. Interoperability, it's certainly easier to compare genomes uh, uh, on, on computers. Um, so what I mean by interoperability here is that if you imagine that you have a, a strain of, of a cyanobacterium and a strain of a methanogenic archaean, um, you would design quite different experiments to, to study those two organisms. And in fact, they would be many ways not comparable in the laboratory just because the data would be very different. And so, uh, whereas genomes are, are, are more directly comparable, although it is true that we would focus genomic comparisons within a, a, a relevant group as well. So anyway, I mean, you know, for whatever it's worth, uh, people can, and by the way, what's not on this list is that uh, several, you know, several important countries uh, cannot uh, easily submit their strains to two culture collections. And so that would be another huge plus uh, for, for, for genomes here. And so, you know, this is interesting. Um, so what, by the way, what's better evidence for a taxon? Um, you know, 20 parts of 20 bones, um, or would you rather have a, a complete genome or a near complete genome? Um, I, I would, of course I want both and I want more, Right, ne I would be satisfied with neither of these, but if we want to name the organisms on our planet and and then be able to study them carefully, um, I I think I'd rather have a genome. It's the most important datum. It's the most important single datum for uh, taxonomic purposes, in my opinion. No matter what taxon we're talking about. Okay, so that brings up the Seek Code Initiative. And I'll leave this at a relatively high level, but basically this is an alternative or a separate code of nomenclature that hopefully if we can finish this will allow genome sequence data to serve as the nomenclatural type. Uh, again, this is founded on the, the idea that the genome is the single best datum to identify a taxon. And with modern single cell genomics and, and uh, uh, metagenomics, um, we have a lot of capability to get these kinds of data. Um, once we have a genome, um, we would, uh, you know, I personally would use 95% average nucleotide identity as a first crack to, to identify species, okay, um, or delineate species as well. Um, and then for a larger uh, view of the taxonomic position, um, I would use phylogenomic approaches, um, and I would start with the genome taxonomy database, and then I would, uh, you know, probe the genome taxonomy database to see whether I agree. Okay, these are the same basic approaches, by the way, that I would use for a pure culture. Okay, that bears a repeat. These are the same approaches. Okay, this is the same thing I would do for a pure culture. So, anyway, the goal is to allow formal naming of a cultivated archaea and bacteria to really uh, uh, improve communication. Okay, so, um, you know, Barney Whitman uh, proposed. Uh, amending the ICNP, and that failed. And so um, we had a paper uh, uh, last year in uh, Nature Microbiology where we said that if that vote failed, 
we would make an, a new system. And that system uh, we're now proposing to call the seek code. And this is just sort of a, 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 a graph that shows the validation process uh, for a name under the seek code. And this isn't quite finished either, by the way, but it's getting very close now. Um, so as part of the seek code initiative, we held a number of workshops online. We got uh, over 800 registrants um, from six continents and I think uh, 42 countries at least. Um, so that made us happy. We asked the, the registrants, um, who, you know, what kind of microbiologist, what flavor are you? And wonderfully, we got a lot of registrants who identified us as, as uh, systematists. And by the way, we also got uh, systematists from the other codes. So we could pick their brains and get their uh, best practices. We also got a lot of participation from the microbial ecology community. And these are two communities that are really important to get together because this group is, is going uh, uh, out into nature and they're finding these genomes and finding these organisms and they're studying them. And they don't really know how to organize the information uh, very well without attaching names, okay? And, and so when we put these two flavors of scientists together, we can get some beautiful things that come out. At the end of the workshops, we asked uh, the participants how likely they would be to use the seek code in the future. And greater than 90% said they were extremely likely or likely to use the code. I hope we don't, uh, you know, I hope we could put a good product uh, together for them. And I hope that this ends up being, being true. It's really the only way we could scale out to this uncultivated majority problem. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into the ugly and the last part of the talk and I'll get into some data. And so this is a paraphrased question at a scientific meeting. It was actually at a business meeting. After my presentation, um, somebody asked a, a question and the question wasn't really a question because they said, you don't even know if that organism lives in hot springs. And this was after a, a, a presentation where I said that we had enriched an organism um, in situ in a hot spring. And we had gotten a number of genomes on different samples and different dates um, from several different hot springs. We had single cell genomes and metagenomes. And so um, and we were pretty confident that the organism lived in hot springs um, for many reasons. And so anyway, you know, this is the ugly, but I wanna show you um, I want to use this, this uh, uh, actually, by the way, it's not really an ugly question. Um, it, it wouldn't be an ugly question if I hadn't just given the presentation that I think was pretty convincing, but it's not an ugly question for genomes. Um, and by the way, it's also not an ugly question for strains. Okay, so people listening to this, um, if they got a strain or if they got a genome out of uh, chicken poop or, or soil, or something like that. How many, how many of you know that your microbe uh, really lives in that habitat, or maybe it's in that habitat ephemerally? Um, so it's a challenge for all of us, and it's actually not a not an ugly question, really. Um, it, it's a good question. So, um, so I'm going to take you on a trip to Great Boiling Spring. This is in northwestern Nevada, and this is this spring is nearly boiling. And as a result, uh, the, the microbial diversity that inhabits the spring is very low. So this is, this is a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot of shredded metagenomic contigs, which just shows the most abundant uh, genomes in, in a, a sediment sample, or I'm sorry, a, a, yeah, a sediment sample taken right around this location. And what we can see is that, you know, these form very, uh, or pretty discrete clouds in just in NMDS space based on tetranucleotide word frequency. And um, none of these organisms, when I started my research here 15 years ago or so, uh, 16, none of them had been cultivated, all right? Um, uh, in fact, at a, uh, th th this it was a member of the chloroflexi or chlor chloroflexota, but when we started work, it was predicted to be a phylum. So actually not, none of these, um, had a representative of a phylum, okay? So how do I study that ecosystem, you know? The, the ICMP doesn't work at all here. Um, eventually we isolated this organism 
And so we were able to name it and we, we disagreed with the, the earlier prediction that it was a phylum. So we demoted it to a class. Um, by the way, we also isolated this organism here, which was also predicted to be, be a phylum. And I'm also going to demote it to a class. Um, so anyway, that's the way this stuff goes. But we use the best we can. But anyway, these are the, these other organisms are all still relatively mysterious. Here's a Candidatus genus that has some nice data behind it. But the others, there's not a lot of data. And I'm going to tell you about one of these groups, originally called PSL4 or HWCG3 um, or Igarchiota. And all these names I would consider defunct. And that gets to the problem of, of communicating about these organisms. Anyway, this is a, a, a phylogenomic tree. And he, right here is Igarchiota, showing that it's a major cluster in what has sometimes been called the tax superphylum. The A is for Igarchiota. So anyway, it's, it's, it's a major lineage. I don't think it's a phylum, but it is a major lineage. Um, so it was originally um, predicted from a, a whole genome, by the way, not a part of a genome, um, a whole comp composite genome stitched together by phosmids by Takuro Nonora in a Japanese gold mine. And um, he named that organism Candidatus caldiarchaeum subterraneum. Um, although it actually fails the recommendations for Candidatus status, by the way, um, because it's, it's uh, genomic data. Um, so anyway, they predicted some uh, characteristics and um, I came along and um, looked at a 16S tree. And so we named nine groups. G1, G2, uh, very uh, interestingly and creatively. Um, so I think these might be genera based on 16S, but that's sort of crude. And then we mapped those genera into habitats. This is based on 16S data and so, um, and, and into geographic locations. And so anyway, you know, we knew something about these organisms, but not a whole lot from these data. Um, and by the way, uh, Zheng Shuang Hua, from uh, Wenjun's lab had a really nice, uh, you know, the, the best genome paper for the Igarchiota, um, where he, he made some, some serious progress on the, the predicted uh, uh, physiology and also evolution of that group. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about in, in the rest of the talk is organisms that correspond to our predicted uh, uh, G1, group one, group five, and group seven, and presumably some of the other groups are in this taxon, but we don't have genomes for those. And so really the, the, um, the, the key thing that we observed is that in one experiment, we put corn stover, so this is uh, uh, treated corn cobs and things like that, into, the, into a tea bag, and we put that tea bag into a spring, a great boiling spring, and we let it incubate for six months, and we pulled it out, and it was black, and it was partially degraded, um, this is sulfitic, so it's a macanoite, I believe. And um, anyway, we're able to document that one of the groups of Igarchiota, uh, the group four, okay, this one, um, uh, this uh, genus or possibly genus level group became enriched during this enrichment. And so we thought, you know, hey, you know, um, and by the way, we had metagenome assembled genomes from several sources. And so we looked in those genomes and we, we could predict they were anaerobes and we knew they were enriched with corn stover and we made some other predictions. And so we said, hey, you know, wh why don't we use these predictions to try to grow this organism? And so we made 13 different media here. Um, has, been, has that been in a way? Um, we made 13 different media here and um, we monitored their growth through time. And uh, what we saw was that in these two, two uh, uh, conditions, A8 and A10, we were able to grow this organism, okay? We maintain this organism in the lab. And by the way, we, we've grown it in the lab for over four years now. Um, however, we had matching media and matching conditions with no growth here. And the only difference is that these media contain some spring water that was filtered and autoclaved, um, and these did not. This was a fully synthetic medium designed to match the geochemistry of the spring. Okay, and so um, you know th this thing requires spring water 
at least in, under these conditions. And so we made a hypothesis based on this experimental data and the genomes that we had that this group um, is that they require tungsten. And this is, we predicted this based on looking in the genome and we found six annotated tungsten dependent aldehyde paradox and oxidoreductases. And so these would be predicted to, to grow in tungsten uh, or would be predicted to use tungsten. By the way, the prediction that they required tungsten is, was a bit of a leap of faith because only one organism in the literature that we can find is a strain of thermococcus has been shown to require tungsten. And so, but, you know, we, we thought about other ideas like for example, nickel, but tungsten is what we predicted and ended up focusing on. And lo and behold, uh, we were right. Okay, so um, this shows um, some, uh, some derivatives of these media, either the spring water medium or the synthetic medium doped with tungsten, okay? And then what we did is we, we grew a bunch of cultures and we quantified the organisms in the cultures um, using 16S, uh, and this is a, a log graph here, an exponential graph. And what we can see is that two organisms, the genus Caldi microbium, and then the other one, this, this Igarchiota group four, um, these two, this is a log scale. So these are highly uh, statistically significant. Um, th these didn't grow in the synthetic medium unless it was doped with uh, tungsten. We required at least 20 nanomolar tungsten to be able to maintain these organisms in culture. We have a lot of data behind that. Um, so what's behind this? So our prediction is that either an amino acid or sugar is converted to an aldehyde. And it looks like my slide is slightly corrupted here, but here's an aldehyde. And these, uh, these um, uh, um, uh, tungsten dependent aldehyde ferredoxin oxidoreductases are oxidizing that aldehyde group to a carboxylic acid for further metabolism. And this would end up in the, the reduction of ferredoxin and that ferredoxin, those re reducing equivalents from ferredoxin could be used in some way to drive ATP. So this was our general uh, prediction. And so this would allow us to predict that these organisms might use amino acids or sugars. And we could generally, uh, that generally uh, jibed with information that we could gather from the genomes. And so we decided to test this experimentally. And we tested it using a technique called fish nanosims. And fish nanosims is explained down here below. I think a lot of people know that fish in this context is fluorescence in situ hybridization. And so what we're doing is we're using a, uh, an oligonucleotide probe that binds to the 16S ribosomal RNA within ribosomes in the, in the organisms that have been fixed to let the probe come in. And then we can see those uh, that fluorescence and we can identify the organisms. In this case, it was, it was so difficult, we ended up using cardfish which is a, a modern version. But in any case, we could identify using fish, um, the organisms, and, and this is the organism that we identified as uh, one cell of, of this organism. And then, then comes in the nanosims. And uh, this stands for nanometer scale secondary ion mass spectrometry. And what we did is we fed the cultures with heavy isotopes of carbon, and of nitrogen, okay? And so if the cells take up that heavy carbon or that heavy nitrogen, we can, we can identify those isotopes by using nanosims. And uh, in our version of nanosims, we're using a cesium ion beam that we're uh, basically blasting the surface of that cell. And that's uh, uh, releasing secondary ions, small fragments of, of, of <laughs> tissue of parts of this cell are, are coming up and, and um, those have a distinctive carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 12 ratios and distinctive nitrogen 15, nitrogen 14 ratios. And we can, we can uh, analytically uh, uh, measure those ratios using uh, mass spectrometry. And so by doing this, we are able to test the hypothesis that they used amino acids or starch or glucose or xylose or ribose. And again, these are predicted specifically based on, on the genome and the fact that they grew up on corn stover. 
And so um, really clean result that um, they incorporated carbon-13 from xylose. Very clean result. All of the cells, each dot here represents a single cell. Um, and then they very clearly were stimulated to assimilate uh, uh, ammonium with, uh, with xylose. Um, these other carbon sources didn't work. Uh, glucose is a little confusing. Um, so some cells used glucose and some didn't. We we're also able to show that these uh, tungsten dependent aldehyde ferrodox and oxidoreductases are expressed. They're expressed both in lab cultures and they're also expressed in, in the environment in situ in Great Boiling Spring. And in lab cultures are actually differentially expressed based on the carbon source, either xylose or corn stover. And we're also able to show expression of, of the transporters. Now, people might recognize this is old school. So we're using um, uh, reverse transcriptase uh, PCR here to, to see if, if, if the mRNA is present. I'll tell you that, that uh, uh, metatranscriptomus is very difficult in boiling water. Um, the RNA doesn't survive very well. So anyway, that gets us to the proposed mechanism of tungsten dependence in more detail. And so this is our proposal. So we think that xylose is being transported in and being converted to xylose. Xylu, uh, xylulose, excuse me, that's phosphorylated and then um, uh, metabolized to ribose 5-phosphate within the pentose phosphate pathway. It then would be converted, we're not sure exactly how, into pyruvate. Pyruvate would be de decarboxylated into the aldehyde. And um, then the aldehyde would be, um, would be oxidized using one or more of these aldehyde ferrodox and oxidoreductases, which are using tungsten from the top transporter. And that would reduce fer oxidized ferrodoxin pools into reduced ferrodoxin. And those reducing equivalents could be used to reduce um, uh, 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 protons at uh, uh, type four nickel iron um, uh, membrane bound hydrogenase. And this would create, this is a proton translocating uh, membrane, membrane complex that would uh, uh, create a, 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 a proton motive force, which could be used to make ATP using a, a F0, F1 type ATPase. And so this is the general mechanism. I won't say that we know all the details, but this is the general mechanism we think for this organism. And so, um, you know, we have friends luckily. And so we reached out to our friends and we said, hey, we're doing some interesting work here do you have any genomes that are related to these organisms? And we got a great response from Anna Louise Reisenbach um, for marine hydrothermal systems, Matt Stott in, in hot, hot springs in New Zealand. We got a lot of genomes from uh, uh, Wenjun Li's group and, and from Tingchong, China. And we got a lot of genomes from Dan Coleman and Eric Boyd in Yellowstone National Park. And, you know, we don't need to go through the data streams here. This takes a lot of work, but we had good friends who are willing to share their work with us. And uh, with this, we got many, many uh, genomes, environmental genomes. We got so many that we decided to be very picky about what we were doing. So we took only high quality mags. So mags are metagenome assembled genomes. So we, we got 80. Okay, and so these high quality genomes are estimated to be 90% complete, less than nine, less than 5% contamination. And then here's just some genome stats based on these 80. Okay, so the medium, uh, median number of contigs is 41, median N50 score is 37, medium, median largest contig is 123 kilobases, uh, median read, read coverage is 42, and the median estimated contamination is zero. Okay, this is for all 80, and I'll jump to the chase, but we designated nomenclatural types shown by these asterisks, and the, the stats would be way, way better for these nomenclatural types because naturally we're picking the best nomenclatural types. And I'm also gonna point out right now that these shades represent species level groups that are defined by average nucleotide identity. And I hope you can see really quickly that we got many high quality genomes from most of the species. There are some exceptions here, um, but most of them have many high quality genomes. And this gives us a lot of power to analyze the data with a very uh, high degree of confidence. 
Um, so anyway, back to my frustration before, do they live in hot springs? Well, these genomes were only required in neutral pH geothermal systems, but they're global, they're both marine and terrestrial, okay? The ribosomal RNA GC content and amino acid content, both uh, can be modeled and those predict high temperatures. We enrich them in situ at 80, about for six months, they grew up. We enrich them in the lab and have grown them uh, for about uh, over four years also at 80. So these are hot spring organisms. Thank you, thank you, they are. Okay, so uh, naturally with all these genomes, we wanted to assess their taxonomy. And so we, we use the ARC-122 marker set from the genome taxonomy database. We didn't use parts of these genes, but we used the entire genes and we modeled um, the evolution of, of each gene using protest then we concatenated them and partitioned uh, the, the uh, super matrix. So we got the appropriate evolutionary model for each gene. And then we used maximum likelihood with uh, RaxML with a thousand bootstraps. My postdoc, Marika Palmer did this and she's just amazing. So this is a really nice job. So we wanted to look at the in-group taxonomy um, within the GTDB cluster, within the GTB family. And so we use 95% ANI, and we came up with 11 species. These are very discrete uh, ANI clusters, and so we feel pretty good about this. To look at genera, we looked at 65% uh, AAI clusters, which uh, Costas recommends, Costas constantinitis. And we also looked at monophyly on the phyl phylogenomic analysis. And we also looked at the re relative evolutionary distance. In this case, there was strong concordance uh, of delineating the genera. We came up with four genera and those are shown in the shades of uh, sort of teal, purple, blue, and, and uh, uh, brown there. Um, so anyway, I'm not gonna go through detail here, but we also assessed the taxonomy of the Igarchiota in, in, in general. And we ended up agreeing with the GTDB that, that this should not be a phylum. So we, we think they're a class called Caldarchiales within the GTDB. And we, we think that's the appropriate name. And they're within the, the, the um, I'm sorry, that's the order. Um, the, the, the class is Nitrososphaeria um, and the, the, the uh, uh, phylum is Thermoprotea, um, or Thermoproteota. And so um, we went ahead and gave names uh, to these organisms because we felt like we did quite a lot of work and we gathered quite a lot of data within these organisms. The type um, uh, for the family is uh, Wolframi eraptor, uh, Wolframi eraptor gerlachensis. Uh, so Wolfram, uh, Wolf, Wolframium is uh, the, the Latin name for tungsten and raptor refers to um, uh, grabbing or, or uh, so this is the tungsten grabber. Uh, it's the tungsten grabber from Gerlach, Nevada is the town where Great Boiling Spring is found. Uh, so we like the name Wolframi Eraptor and uh, Aaron Oren helped us to check uh, uh, and improve these names. And we named the family uh, Wolframi Eraptor ACA. Um, so these are all unofficial at this point. There's no venue to name these organisms or, de or designate types. And so that's why we need a system, right? Because we, we think we're doing a pretty good job here. We did some other analyses on these uh, aldehyde ferdoxin oxidoreductase uh, of, of gene family. And basically in uh, all of the genera, uh, so these colors on the phylogenetic tree represent uh, uh, you know, clades where a genus has a, has a group and so, you know, all through this family of enzymes, um, we have, have, have members within the, the, the family Wolframi Raptoraceae all over here. Um, we also uh, did some clustering according to predicted uh, protein folds. And here's a, 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 um, a principal components analysis, which really recapitulates the same clusters. And this it's a lot, allows us to make some predictions of the functions of each of these clades of enzymes. I don't really have time to go into the detail, but I just want to tell you that we're thinking about this in a lot of detail. And once we had these, you know, clades designated within the enzyme families, we were able to study their evolution. And so this is a, a, an ancestral character state reconstruction 
that um, uh, Marika Palmer did in my lab. And this node here is the, the last common ancestor, the common ancestor of the family Wolframii raptoraceae. And um, above the node, you can see a bunch of these boxes. And these boxes represent either gains or ancestral presence in this case. And these, these colors map over here to all of these uh, uh, tungsten dependent uh, uh, um, um, aldehyde uh, ferredox and oxidoreductases. Um, by the way, this, this orange is the top transporter for transporting tungsten. And so we, we think that, that um, you know, tungsten was really critical uh, for the origin of this family, the origin, the evolution of this family. And we still have even gains of more enzymes in this family throughout the evolution of the family. And so, you know, we think this isn't just a, not just a, a, a characteristic of wolf Ramii raptor uh, Gerlach ensis, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a trait of the whole family. And by the way, we were able to model the evolution of other key uh, uh, metabolic factors to think about, uh, you know, the characteristics of these organisms, but I, I, I won't take time to go through that. And so, in the end, you know, what do we know about Wolframii raptor Gerlachensis? Um, you know, we, we actually have only found it in a single habitat. This species only found it one place. The genus we find all over the place, but the species is, is only found there. Um, so Great Boiling Spring, uh, Nevada, um, it's probably not present in other places because we've looked pretty hard in genomic data. So it might be an endemic organism. Um, in fact, I, I think it probably is. Um, so we have near complete genomes, several samples, several dates, several sequencing methods. Um, we've got very good genomes from this organism. We know the growth temperature and pH, but we don't know the range or the optimum, okay? So that's not as good as a culture. We also know temperature abundance relationships in the hot spring um, by, by uh, looking at 16S amplicons and metagenomes sampled from different locations. We have a pretty good knowledge of the community of microbes that this species lives in. So we can think about its friends and what its friends do. Um, we know it requires tungsten, at least under the conditions we grow it. it. Does it always require tungsten? We don't know that. We do know that tungstoenzymes are ancestral and ubiquitous in the family that this organism belongs to. We know that it's an anaerobe. Um, so we, I think we know the details pretty well. I think this is not going to be tolerant of oxygen at all. Um, the carbon source is, is xylose. We don't find any evidence of other carbon sources, possibly glucose, but not, not these others. Of course, negative data doesn't mean they can't use them. You know, we're not quite sure. Nitrogen source for sure, ammonium. Others, you know, we haven't tested. Okay. But by the way, we, 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 uh, um, we didn't see carbon uh, from amino acids getting into the cell, so maybe uh, maybe nitrogen isn't used as well. So we have a pretty good prediction of the central uh, energy metabolism. And so I just want to end by just sort of bouncing back. So I went through you know a lot of details pretty fast about the Wolframii raptor ACA, and I just want to sort of bounce like what 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 does Wolframii raptor ACA look like? under the ICNP and the seek code, okay? So under the ICNP, there's, there's a legacy of a bunch of uh, names out there. So there's Igarchiota, there's uh, HWCG3, there's PSL4, there's a, a, a groups one through nine from my lab. There's a bunch of names. This is confusing stuff, okay? There's a few Candidatus names, okay? Um, but, uh, actually, uh, only, um, only um, uh, actually, I made a mistake here. This one does not satisfy the name. So I think only Candidatus wolframii raptor complies with the recommendations for Candidatus. So none of the names would have priority. And actually, per the recommendations, we would only really have one uh, Candidatus name. So under the seek code, these legacy publications still exist. So we'll still have all these strange codes out there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, that are out there in the literature. But what I would do is I would work with others, collaborators and people in the field to formally propose names within the family with priority. And in fact, I would even bounce it outside to the, to the order. So we, we would try to name 
the order called, called Archaeales, the family called Archaeaceae, um, the, the genus and species called the Archaeum subterraneum, and we would name uh, the family Wolframii raptoraceae, four genera and 11 species, and we would have some failures because the, the qual in this case, the quality would fail into the seq code, um, so that one wouldn't be named. So um, anyway, I, I, you know, I think we're looking at a pretty different world here. We have a very good structure with names. We have a lot of information about uh, the, the species in Great Boiling Spring, and we have pretty darn good genomes, and we've thought quite a bit about the other organisms. So with that, I'm just going to thank uh, especially the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and also the ISME Society for funding the work I'm talking about. Actually, NASA also is important here. So with that, I'm going to end the show and um, I'm going to uh, let people ask questions. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for this uh, excellent talk. It was very nice to have a practical comparison between the ICNP and the, <clears throat> and the SIG code. Um, especially, I was very pleased that uh, we've had 11 new nomenclature types that have a taste for tungsten. And, <laughs> you know, th that, that's really amazing to see what microbial uh, systematics and especially with the newer methods we can achieve, what was hidden from our eyes for, for ages together. So um, it's been very interesting and thank you for that. Uh, you have generated a lot of interest and we have got ample questions to keep you busy. So uh, I'll, I'll start the show with the questions. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Jian Yu Zhao. Uh, the question is that GTDB has changed a lot of names, range from genus to phylum level. This makes our ex existing names more complicated. And do we really need to change these names, especially in phylum level? What do you think of this? Okay, I have a very, uh, maybe a radical view of this, um, and I, but I want people to listen to my radical view. So uh, my radical view is this. Um, a lot of people are concerned about the past, right? So with uh, Delta proteobacteria names and actinobacteria names and, and uh, you know, whatever, put your favorite tax on there. And, um, you know, I get apprehensive when I don't know the names and I get confused and, oh gosh, you know, what's going on here? But here's my radical view. I think the future hopefully will be much longer than the past. So I think that we should use all the tools that we have to the best of our ability to put together uh, an orderly uh, system, okay? Uh, which includes names that 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 you know are uh, follow rules and make it easy to trace uh, th priority through lineages, and so um, so I actually strongly favor it. Um, I, I think it's a, a great idea. So the next question then is, you know, do people believe in the in the premise of of the GTDB? I believe in the premise of the GTDB. But every time I, I uh, you know, work on new lineages, I, I always question the GTB. In this particular case, I, I came up with perfect agreement. I agree perfectly with the GTDB. But some of the other lineages that we're studying right now, I have a few disagreements. Um, and But I think Phil Hugenholtz and Donovan Parks and that team, I think they would say that we should question, uh, you know, if we, if we if I, the lineage I'm thinking of, we're adding uh, uh, five or 10 times more genomes to the lineage. And of course we should reevaluate the, 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 you know, the phylogenomics and, and uh, change the names as appropriate. And so it reminds me a little bit of, of uh, a paper from 1909, um, Hitchcock, and I can't remember his name. And uh, Hitchcock um, was part of the first uh, literature on nomenclatural types and in one of his original papers, he said that um, we should forget about the idea of having stability in names. Uh, we, we don't want stability in the names. We don't want it to be wild, okay? 
but um, but uh, as long as we're scientists when we're making progress, there's going to be some instability. What we want is a good framework. We want a good framework that that's objective, um, that's communicated well with the community of researchers. Um, those are the things we want. And I think, in my, in my opinion, GTDB gives that to us, and I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And especially, I mean, the whole essence of doing science is to is to challenge what is established norm, and that's that's what because uh, you know unless you challenge the existing theories, you won't come up with new ones or uh, um, test the existing ones that they stand the ground with the new technology that we have available. Yeah. That's right. And by the way, I'll just mention, I, I think absolutely. I think the stuff will stabilize some. Uh, it's going to take a little while, but mm -hmm. if uh, in 50 years or, thir or, or, or gosh, in five years, I think we, we mm -hmm. will have made a lot of progress and, and things will be stabilizing quite a bit, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next question is, uh, what is the cost versus benefit? of knowing the uncultivated unknown? Do we really need to know as taxonomists? Uh, that's a question coming from uh, Ratan. This is most of the tree of life. And so, um, <laughs> you know, my, 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 uh, my, my own history, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't start as a taxonomist. You know, I, I started as somebody who loved uh, insects when I was a kid. I had insect collections and, and I, I, I love those insects and I, mm -hmm. I still love plants and animals. And, um, and so I'm, 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 I'm my, my primary interest is the world around me and, and the creatures that live with me. Um, and that includes, uh, I became a microbiologist because I couldn't casually learn about them because I couldn't right. see them. And, and so it was, a, it was a personal problem to me. So that's why I became a microbiologist and mm -hmm. um, these dark lineages, uh, they're important. So and everybody should decide what's important for them. But for me, it's right. important. Right. Um, the next question comes from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. Um, the question is, how can we determine a genome as representing different levels of the taxa? Is there any stable system for their classification without knowing the phenotypic characters? So I think I would say, yeah, yeah I would say the phenotypic characters uh, shouldn't shouldn't be uh, considered very much. Okay, so that that might be a little radical too. So the genome, um, mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, is is the major driver behind modern taxonomy, um, whether or not a, a microbe is cultured. Um, so, uh, so I think the you know, the, 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 again, I, I would, I, I like the genome taxonomy database. Okay. Um, I don't think it should just be trusted immediately, but I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, I, to me, it's the go-to starting platform. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Leaping How. Um, hi, Brian, may I know why did you use Constover to enrich the IGAR Kyoto? members from the hot spring. How did you know that they can utilize this material? I didn't know. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so I, I, had, uh, I had some a very small amount of money from the Department of Energy to study mm -hmm. biofuels and corn stover uh, is a major waste product. It's a major agricultural waste product. Uh, so corn stover is corn stalks and leaves and recalcitrant uh, lignocellulose. And so, you know, there's, there's interest in all over the world to convert agricultural wastes into fuels. And so uh, I convinced the Department of Energy to give me a little bit of money. And uh, as part of that little grant, I, I said, hey, I'm gonna study what happens to corn stover at really high temperatures. And I tested some other biofuel substrates. Um, those hadn't been tested uh, at these high temperatures uh, very much. And mm -hmm. so, um, so it was just an observation. Once we once we threw the corn stover in there, we were able to see that this organism grew up. Okay, um, that's that's interesting. Many of the discoveries in science have been made uh, by chance. Yeah, yeah. So next question comes from uh, Bhagwan Rekhardwad. 
uh, what if the culture collection in two different countries is a uh, lost type species? As per your proposal to consider genome as type, ICNP or the C code committee will allow to do so for the what? Um, I don't know if you were able to hear me uh, with the full question because my internet got disconnected. So the basic question is, if the type species is lost by both the culture collections, what would be the new um, name and whether the committee allows for such lost types? Yeah, so my understanding under the ICNP, the current rules, is that, um, you know, we, we could, um, <laughs> that, that that organism would become candidatus, it would lose its status. Uh, there's a number mm -hmm. of organisms that have, have done that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, um, if the ICNP in the future would ever accept genomes as, as types, uh, nomenclatural types, then the genome from that organism, if it exists, um, could be designated as a neotype, and then that right. name still exists. Um, under the seq code, it, it's, there's no problem because the, the genome would be the, the nomenclatural type anyway. Okay. So that's it. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, uh, question is from Tariq Ahmad. Uh, different taxon of prokaryotes has different cutoff values for novel species, genies, uh, species, genus, and family. What are view, your views on this? Um, so my, my, my advice, if you haven't seen Phil Hugenholtz talk, the first one in this series, Right. That's what I'd, I would advise because Phil is Phil is the you know the 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 great at this and also Co Costas Constantinitis. Um, so mm -hmm. at the species level, uh, Costas Constantinitis has some amazing publications lately. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is by Jane et al. J A I N uh, in two thousand nineteen, and uh, they they compared. Uh, is it 96,000? I can't remember um, right. uh, genomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And amazingly, what they see is, is a gap, um, a pretty good gap. Um, so uh, but, um, below 95% average nucleotide identity, um, mm -hmm. the, there's a, a, a very large gap um, where there's no organ, very few pairwise comparisons in that gap. And so mm -hmm. they argue that that could be a, a functional and, and, and biologically meaningful um, cutoff. And that cutoff would probably be driven by recombination barriers um, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, that exist below a certain uh, threshold of, of sequence identity. Um, so anyway, I, th I, think, uh, I think there's pretty good agreement, although the next presentation by Marika Palmer I think she'll yes. get a, a, more, a more detailed and and more uh, more informed. So that's my caveman sort of yeah. simple uh, thing. Now, in terms uh, of uh, other taxonomic ranks, the genome, you know, Phil Hubenholtz, uh, I, I I believe in his system that there should never uh, be a, a, a sequence similarity cutoff. Um, that could be a maybe a little bit of a guide, but. Um, but I, I I I I subscribe to the view that that um, that uh, taxonomic ranks should have coexisted in the past, and therefore um, you should look at the relative uh, divergence, uh, relative evolutionary divergence, and so in that way there are no differences, so they're right. all the same. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the next question comes from Praveen Rahi. Uh, the question is, what if the genome sequence is removed from the database? Does seq code consider such situations? It happened recently when a few researchers from a uh, country removed their genome sequence data uh, from the database, especially for the SARS-CoV-2 genomes. Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that that's been done deliberately. <laughs> that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am aware that genomes are sometimes lost um, mm -hmm. in the databases. I mean, we shouldn't we shouldn't pretend that that these things uh, will be perfect. Um, right. So I, I think I think it will happen. Uh, some genomes will be lost or or mislabeled. I've had some that are mislabeled by third mm -hmm. parties. Um, so this this stuff will happen. Um, 
That's a good question. So what, what, what will happen in the, in the seek code? Um, I guess what I would, what I would, um, uh, I'm thinking of what's written in the current draft. I think the draft would say that we could designate a different genome as a neotype, as long as it's okay. in the same 95% any cluster. Okay. Um, yeah. At least that's what it should say. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question is again an anonymous. Uh, it comes, uh, the question is uh, for your HQ genomes in analysis, that's high quality, why do you use 90% completeness and 5% contamination as a cutoff? These are uh, random, <laughs> these are uh, sort of community accepted cutoffs that have been okay. proposed by a bunch of people, including the Genome Standards Consortium. Right. Um, the next question is uh, again anonymous. Uh, the work of uh, Wolf Rami Taurus, uh, Wolf Rami Raptoraceae is so good. Uh, there are some biological information you showed, such as you uh, checked for the enzymes and all that. So, if you want to search for some enzyme of diversity microorganisms originating from, let's say, feces, how can I realize it using a database? I wonder which database I can use and then how to summarize it. I think the person is beginning into the bioinformatics. So that question probably arises because of that. Can yeah, you share yeah. some? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I mean, th there are good databases for the human microbiome. There was the Human Microbiome Project. Uh, mm -hmm. there, are, there are a number of microbiome projects. In fact, I think you'll probably find a problem of having so much data that you don't know what to do with it. Right. <laughs> so I think that that'll be a big, a big problem. Um, and then I think you need, uh, you know, some, um, a good idea, right? You need some intellect. And in this case, uh, you know, we, we didn't, tungsten wasn't an original idea. Tungsten was a response to a problem. Um, and, and so we only knew that problem because we were doing experiments in the lab. Um, so if, if you, um, anyway, there's a lot of different ways to come to, to ideas. Um, but I, I think that that intellectual part of thinking about what's interesting and why within your experimental system is, is something that's very difficult and it's very important. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that in our case, we, we, didn't, uh, we did not confirm the functions of our enzymes. The behavior of the organism is consistent with the proposed functions of the enzyme. So we don't know those functions as a, as a matter of fact. Um, but one thing my lab is starting to do quite a lot now is that we are uh, synthesizing genes um, through collaborations and we're putting those genes into E. coli as a host, mm -hmm. and we're expressing those genes and purifying the proteins and testing the functions. And so we didn't do that for this study, but we're doing that for some right. of the other studies so that the study doesn't have to stop at, at informatics. You can go further. Right. And that's actually the essence of uh, doing microbial ecology, because once you find an organism, you really want to know, even though it's known only from the mags, you really want to isolate and extract that gene and you know, see what all it does. Yeah. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, the next question is uh, from Sujoy. Um, the question is uh, related to the evolutionary changes. So like artificial genome sequence um, changes happen in E. coli with, you know, a couple of generations. How would you include the new organism in nomenclature classification? Probably the question is the variance between two very similar genomes. How do you decide which one is, is the authentic and which one is the new one or the artificial one? Yeah, I guess I would say that, that if you, um, if, if you, I mean, we have that case for Wolframi, I raptor ACA, right? So we have mm -hmm. multiple genomes from the exact same, I mean, this is the exact same taxon from the spring sampled mm -hmm. on a, a couple of different years. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we have it also growing in the lab. Um, right. Those genomes all cluster together uh, very closely uh, within this 95% uh, average nucleotide identity. In fact, within 99.9% .9 average nucleotide identity. And so uh, would there be some SNPs, some single cell 
uh, nucleotide polymorphisms or some, uh, you know, maybe some gene gains and losses. Sure, there could be. Um, but, you know, average nucleotide identity uh, gives us the path to identify that organism unambiguously. And so we just need to designate one of them as the type. And then each new <clears throat> genome, we ask, uh, are you within the criterion, the 95% anti criterion to that type? If so, it's the same species. If not, then, you know, we could think about calling it a different species. Right. Um, last question. Um, I think it's the essence of our systematics. Um, how do you decide what evolved first, what came second, and how do scientists recognize it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, as far as the, the organisms, um, what we would do is look at the, 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 the branching <laughs> pattern in a, mm -hmm. in, a, in a genome tree. And what we, could, what we can do is we can look at uh, uh, bifurcations in, in that right. uh, genome tree. And so that would tell us the, the, um, you know, the, time, the, the, the relative time that those bifurcations happened. Okay. Right. Um, but in fact, uh, all the organisms that we're studying in my lab, we don't study any microbial fossils in my lab. They're yeah. all living today. Um, so mm -hmm. they're all modern organisms. Um, and, and so what we can talk about is, is modern uh, uh, bifurcations, um, and then we can um, use an ancestral character state reconstructions uh, with, with gene content or even genome sequences um, to look at the evolution or model the evolution of those genomes through time so we can understand right. when key innovations might have happened or key gene acquisitions happened. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, thank you so much, Brian. Um, it was very wonderful, uh, amazing discussion. And I'm sure the participants loved your presentation as well as the discussion that followed. Many questions um, probably cleared the basics of how systematics work and how this new seek code is happening, especially the practical comparison with your experiments that happened. Um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll make a few announcements before we close. Um, so it is, this is for all the participants especially. Uh, you've seen the name Marike Palmer coming up in uh, Brian's presentation uh, quite a few times. Marike is a postdoc in uh, Brian's lab, and she will be our presenter for uh, the next Business Live session in September. And uh, most of your questions related to how do you decide what comes first, what comes second, what's the definition of the species, uh, especially the prokaryotic definition. Uh, she's going to talk about all of those things and I'm sure um, that talk will be uh, as excellent as uh, Brian's uh, today. Um, the next announcement is related to the content of Business Live. Um, we've uh, contacted a lot of uh, faculty all over the world the content of Business Live is available on our YouTube channel. Um, so it's permanently available to be used in classroom sessions by, by faculty all over the world. So you can just go ahead, download the videos or include them in your coursework for your students to watch because this is the latest information we can share about uh, what's happening in the field of uh, microbial systematics. So this becomes a permanent course material. And as we go along, we will include a lot of uh, basic uh, information about uh, systematics as well as uh, you know, the latest that's changing with the field as we progress with new techniques and new uh, technolo uh, technologies. Um, so please subscribe to the YouTube channel where uh, you can listen to the most of the updated posts. Um, and uh, go to our website to see who's our next speaker. We have lined up excellent speakers until the end of this year. And then um, probably by uh, October, November, we'll come up with the, with the new list for 2022. Um, thank you, Brian, once again. Thank you for uh, uh, speaking and being awake. Uh, it's almost uh, 1.30 for you in the morning, right? 
Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you once again. And thank you to all the participants. And thank you, Amit Venjun, for uh, uh, giving me a backup for this. Thanks a lot. We'll Thanks, go. everybody. Thanks, Brad. Thanks. Thank it's you. It's good to see everybody. Yeah.